Hi guys. Well, I appreciate you sticking with me. So anyway, we are in the middle of chapter 23 titled St. Peter's Woody, where I am in the middle of taking a trip on the hallucinogenic cactus San Pedro, which is mescaline is what it is. And so uh, one more time, a TMI alert. This is the only place in a Peruvian plunge where we get a little bit X-rated. But uh, it is what it is. If you don't care to hear uh, this crap, you can very well just skip over this uh, little section here and move on to chapter 24. But the ones... Uh, <laughs> and want to hear what happened next on my unfolding San Pedro cactus trip. Here we go. After that TMI alert. <clears throat> In the middle of all this rain spattered sexual confusion swirling around my mescaline infused celibate brain, Celibacy has been more of a byproduct of the spiritual path than an objective. I was suddenly thrust, or should I say I penetrated, into one of the most bizarre parallel universes of any I have ever encountered in my various hallucinogenic ramblings. The land of pussy past there is no land of pussy present in my life, even in a parallel universe, and after what I'm getting to report, there will no doubt be no land of pussy future for me either. There, this damn computer, uh, guys, is really... Uh, causing me uh, a lot of pain. Anyway, <clears throat> there, dancing in front of me like so many rose pink munchkins from the Wizard of Oz, were a dozen or so of my favorite pussies I have known in my life. I don't mean images of the women the pussies were attached to. I mean actual little detached labia and clits complete with their own individual little pussy personalities that I have had the pleasure of knowing, I actually had to force myself to recall the names and faces of the women that some of these little dancing pussies belong to. Since every single sexual relationship I have ever been in has crashed and burned, from a purely sexual standpoint at least, it was little surprise that some of the women attached to some of my favorite pussies weren't even my favorite people. The only message I can bring back with me from the land of pussy past is that my lifetime of failure in the sexual relationship realm has nothing to do with pussy per se, but everything to do with the brains or the lack thereof of the women directing those pussies, not to mention my own brain's part in the various dramas. For the record, celibate, though I may be, pussy is still my friend. All those friendly little pussies from my past danced away into the night like a fleeting school of mermaids disappearing around the bend of the Mother of God, leaving me alone celibate, cold, wet, starving, and stoned out of my gourd on the muddy riverbank. Seeking shelter from the storm, I headed back up the hill toward the lodge. Anyone who has ever tripped on hallucinogens know how otherworldly strange it can be to walk, or should I say float, across a not very familiar landscape, particularly at night considering the fact that only a few glowing candle flames illuminated Manu Learning Center, the buildings appeared even more ghostly. 
I was almost relieved by the fact that I was such a stranger in a strange land, knowing that my irrelevant position as Manu Learning Center's invisible man would greatly reduce the chance of any social encounter betray betraying my inappropriate behavior. I was thankfully correct in this assumption. I managed to sneak by the crowded dining room, which I probably could have done buck naked blowing a bugle, and up the stairs to the community bedroom where I changed into some dry clothes and annihilated my week's supply of Oreos. As I sat in the dark at the top of the, deep, of the steep staircase, munching away these wild psychedelic visions, mostly in deep maroons and gold like you might find in an embroidered dining chair from Victoria, England, began to explode like mushroom clouds behind my eyeballs. Again, I have this vague feeling that something big rolled into my subconscious behind the exploding psychedelic visions, but who is to say? I have no idea if I was at the top of those stairs for 10 minutes or 30 before I was routed out of my revelry by two of my roommates coming up the steps. If they were surprised to find the weird old fart from Texas sitting alone in the dark at the top of the stairs surrounded by a half dozen Oreo wrappers, they didn't mention anything. No doubt due in part to the Oreos, I now had a new crisis to face. I was thirsty as hell, and the only drinking water to be had was in the dining room, where perhaps 20 people still remain. The last thing I needed that night was to be roped into some banal conversation. Polishing my invisible shield to its highest luster and pasting on my most normal look I could muster under the circumstances, I furtively entered the dining room. None other than the mighty Joaquin Rivers himself and his spaniel-eyed shadow soaking up every pearl of wisdom issuing forth from his master's lips like it was manna from heaven, occupied the very table closest to the water cooler. Shit! Like a nervous gazelle sneaking a surreptitious swig from a crocodile-infested Serengeti waterhall, I sidled up to the upturned five-gallon jug and nervously measured out a glass of water. I need not, need not have worried if either Joaquin or Miguel, neither of whom had spoken to me once since our little chat on Sunday about Hunt Oil, noticed my presence at the water cooler, not one word or gesture from them betrayed that knowledge. My thirst slaked, I was just about re to retreat to the sanctuary behind my cucaracha net when I noticed Ramon holding court in front of seven or eight hushed audience members at one of the long dining tables. <clears throat> Even though I could not understand one word he was saying, Brother Mescalito whispered to me to pull up a chair and listen to the story. Ramon was describing a fight he had had with a poisonous snake he had met in an ayahuasca vision, but that's about as far as I could get with the details. But the details, or the story itself, weren't what the San Pedro gods wanted me to hear. Brother Mescalito whispered to me to sit in a chair three seats down from Ramon's right side profile. I was instructed further to gaze softly at this face through my eyelashes and let his unintelligible words float over and through me, making no effort to understand or translate them. Neither Ramon nor any of his enraptured listeners 
pay the slightest attention to the invisible man's arrival, so I had no problem following Brother Mescalito's directions. <clears throat> the Haram Boot Indian, the latest in a long line of shamans dating back generations, was dressed in a plain white buttoned-up shirt. As always, his long black hair was swept back from his high cheekbones, almond eyes, and square jaw. True to form, his perfect posture was Kapok Tree Shore in his straight back chair. He spoke in a low but confident, steady, lilting monotone, punctuating his monologue with occasional downward swift karate chops as if he were skinning a snake. He told his audience, he held his audience completely spellbound, commanding their undivided attention and respect, though there was nothing the least bit arrogant or egotistical about his delivery. He was illuminated by the flickering flame of one lone taper white candle set in front of him, and occasionally the flame would catch <coughs> the momentary reflection of his strong white teeth when he flashed a quick smile. Following Mescalito's instructions, <coughs> I half closed my eyes and gazed through my eyelashes at the side of his candlelit face. I tuned out everyone else in the room, then the room itself in the process. Soon nobody existed in that room except Ramon and me. I let the lilting cadence of his unintelligible Spanish roll over me. His words though not even in his native language, became a hypnotic chance, chant. As I listened, I could feel myself spiraling backward, plunging deeper and deeper into a time and place not so distant in time or space from where I sat. Right about the time I was a kid staring in horror at Life Magazine's Taming of the Green Hell cover story, Ramon's shaman grandfather very well could have been telling the same story, though not in Spanish, to members of, of his tribe just the other side of the Mother of God River, in the very heart of Amaracare, where the aptly named Hunt Oil Company was hunting for oil. I admit it, guys, with Brother Mescalito and Ramon as my guides, I plunged face first into a shameless gringo noble savage fantasy <clears throat> because in that parallel universe I inhabited <clears throat> for perhaps 15 minutes, I could see it was not a fantasy as all, at all. <clears throat> as riveting as Ramon's story was, his listeners began to drift off one by one until there were just a handful of us left in the room. Still wanting to avoid social intercourse at any cost, I reluctantly pulled myself back into the 21st century and out of my chair and slipped unnoticed from the dining room as invisible as when I had arrived. <clears throat> I stopped in the restroom just long enough to pee and to glance at my face in the mirror, always a harrowing experience, went tripping, <coughs> then headed back to my room. It was 9.40 p.m. <coughs> and six of the beds were already occupied with sleeping <coughs> or pretending to sleep bodies. <coughs> I shimmied down to my birthday suit in the dark and slithered inside the privacy of my cucaracha net to let Brother Mescalito carry me off to La La Land astride his white horse. <clears throat> Looking out from inside the silky white cocoon of my lacy cucaracha net, 
there was just enough milky light in the cloud-obscured full moon to make me feel like I was floating inside of a magic cloud. It had been almost five hours since I had dosed on the San Pedro brew. <clears throat> but when I lay back and closed my eyes, I was delighted to find that the psychedelic visions and swirling geometric patterns were alive and well behind my eyelids. I was just about to ride them into dreamland, in fact, when suddenly a strange blue light swept into the room and lit up my little magic cloud in a soft lavender glow. No, it was not a spaceship coming to spirit me away to the fourth dimension. Damn it! but simply the lilac glow of one of those little LED headlamps so de rigueur of today's hip young eco-tourist. One more TMI alert. This particular headlamp was attached to the head of an attractive 22-year-old brunette from Oregon who was there at Manu Learning Center to attend the Green Empowerment Forum. I had noticed her around campus. She was hard to ignore, particularly as she slept in the unprivate bed less than six feet from me. But, needless to say, I was even more invisible to such a lovely young woman than I was to the rest of the gang of hip, young, beautiful people there. Feigning sleep, I watched my young roommate prepare for bed. As I did, I felt myself becoming, how would they say this in a harlequin romance, aroused? And I mean really fuck the spots off an anaconda horny kind of aroused, the likes of which I had not been aroused in months if not years. Holy shit! With the aid of her headlamp, I could make out the vague, shadowy outlines of her lithe, young, feminine form through the double layer, mine and hers, of lacy cucaracha netting. I could not make out the details. Had I been able to, I no doubt would have seen a fully clothed young woman innocently brushing her hair and plumping her pillow, but I didn't need details. <clears throat> In both of my San Pedro-soaked brains, the mysterious, hazy, feminine form in front of me flitting about flirtatiously in the soft, erotic, lavender glow of the headlamp was clearly my own little private geisha dancer behind the veils showering me with her unspoken but unrequited love and lust. For me, she positively oozed female desire and sensuality as she danced and gyrated for me suggestively. As I surreptitiously slathered myself with sunblock at 10 p.m. on a rainy night, I knew on one hand what I was doing, whacking off to some chick half my age who I was spying on like some pathetic high schooler hiding out in the vent above the girls' locker room, would, in all likelihood, be deemed gross misconduct by some of Manu Learning Center's less open-minded policymakers who just look at life without seeing it like I was doing. If I were to be discovered, not a remote proposition to consider, seeing as how I was hiding behind a mosquito net in a room full of eight people, I would no doubt be looking at an embarrassing situation. On the other hand, the one that had the firmer grasp on the dicey situation, I could see that what I was doing on a spiritual level, of course, 
was nothing more than paying homage to the feminine archetype so lacking in my celibate life. As I turned the matter over to that hand and spirit, I started to get this weird vision that some sort of gooey creature, some kind of cross between a slug and a sponge with brown spotted golden skin was beginning to wrap itself around my erection and giving me head. You might think that this disturbing vision of getting a blowjob by Spongebob would have taken some of the passion out of my homage to the feminine mystique, but you would be wrong. When I finally did release my grip, perhaps five minutes after the oblivious object of my desire flicked off her headlamp, it's amazing the eruption did not wake up the entire room and get me kicked out of Manu Learning Center forever. What a lovely, disturbing, and dangerous way to end my celebration of the full moon. Or so I thought, until 90 minutes later, I was awakened by the rumblings of yet another witty that could have cut glass begging for attention. Jesus, the dude at the Hotel Moderno in Puerto <clears throat> Maldonado <clears throat> was right. Was I 49 going on 50 or 14 going on 15? No wonder they call that phallic cactus St. Peter. For the second time in as many hours, I dug around pathetically for my sunblock lotion and took matters into my own hands again. This time, however, instead of being filleted by some gooey blob of protoplasm, I was attended by a half dozen dragonfly sized little wood nymphs looking like so many naked alabaster skinned miniature tinkerbells with delicate pale green lace wings they fluttered around the head of my cock like hummingbirds around a hibiscus pausing now and then to lap up a drop or two of my oozing manhood now this was sex the way it should be. I held the moment as long as I could, which wasn't long enough. The little wood nymphs flitted away to the next lucky guy's San Pedro vision, and seven hours after welcoming Brother Mescalito into my brain, I finally disappeared into La La Land. <laughs> anyway, if I haven't run you off forever, that uh, brings us to the end of chapter 23. And coming up chapter 24, when uh, my sojourn to the Manu Learning Center comes to its predictable sudden end and the next real chapter begins coming right up.